Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be with you for the next hour. We're currently reading and discussing the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And yesterday, at the end of the broadcast, we were talking about the Pope's plans for America and how papal infallibility influenced the Catholics of this country in a mood, in a sentiment, in a state of mind that was contrary to the very form of government in this United States that they loved. Stop and think about it for a moment. If a loyal and devout Roman Catholic is all of a sudden told, as occurred in 1870 at the First Vatican Council, that the Pope, the vicar of God on earth, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, is not a mere man, but is as it were, God, with the godly attribute of infallibility, what would that do to the mind of these Roman Catholics if they accept that idea? That their Pope is divine, infallible. Does that naturally end in the belief that the Pope is the natural divine right ruler of the world? And if so, how should then Roman Catholics relate to our government, our Protestant government, which has its power rooted in the people, not the Pope? Never mind that the, the United States government uh, was contrary to the monarchical system of Europe, where the Pope picked all the kings, and the kings of the earth ruled at the behest of the Pope, it wasn't even the government in this country that had the power. It was the people. This is rank heresy in the mind of a true Roman Catholic, that the Pope, being the vicar of God, has all the power, and that the governments, if they are to be legitimate must take their power and authority from the Pope and rule as the Pope decrees. If it doesn't, it's a de facto government. It's an illegitimate government. Now, go one step beyond that, the form of government that we have in this country, where the people are above the government. You see, that's an that's an abject heresy to the papacy. And Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical of 1864, said so explicitly, that the people are to be governed. The people are not to govern. And the governments of the world must answer to the Pope, not to the people. Okay, see if we can just wrap our brains around what effect the decree of papal infallibility in 1870 had upon the Catholics of this country. Now, knowing that the long-term strategy of the papacy was to make America Catholic and to replace our Protestant institutions and constitution and form of government with a well, a, a Roman Catholic hierarchical government. In other words, they're going to make America Catholic and put the, put the Pope on the throne of this country. And given also the fact that many of the Roman Catholics in this country were immigrants from foreign countries, uh, 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 Germany, France, Spain, and Ireland, and didn't speak... English as a first language, the country was full of foreign priests, priests who spoke the language of the people. Not only were they foreign priests who had no allegiance to this country and had sole allegiance in the Pope, they were Jesuit priests as well. That sect of Jesuit, uh, of Roman Catholic knights for the Pope 
who are sworn for no other purpose than to destroy Protestantism in the world and all Protestant institutions, as we covered earlier in this chapter, and to make America Catholic, to make the world answer to the Pope, so that the Jesuits could rule the world through the Pope. They were the ones who were sent to this country to educate Roman Catholic children, to raise up the most prestigious educational institutions in this country, to, cha to train Roman Catholic priests into the doctrines and tenets of Jesuitism, ultramontane Catholicism, and to, and to create a Roman Catholic fifth column in this country that would eventually, gradually, bit by bit, Catholicize this country by changing gradually its form of government. And this is the concern of R.W. Thompson as he writes. This design of using foreign priests who were subservient to the papacy, had no loyalties to this country, training the up-and-coming Roman Catholic priests and getting control of politics in Washington. Now, what precautions should the United States have taken? First of all, they should have recognized what the Vatican's intent for this country was. And that's what R.W. Thompson is pointing out here. Now, he's talking about all these foreign priests in this country, and he says, unquestionably, there's some reason for it. And it would seem to be the only satisfactory explanation, uh, explanation of such a fact, that in the opinion of the ecclesiastical authorities of Rome, there is so direct an antagonism between the papacy and a popular form of government, that is, a government of, by, and for the people, like ours, that they do not suppose it for both systems to exist permanently together and therefore have selected these foreigners, these foreign priests, as the most suitable and competent agents to carry on the work of substituting other institutions, that is, papal institutions, for ours. Institutions more congenial to them and more in harmony with the papal views of government. Now, just in refresher, what is the papal view of government? All government is legitimate if it gets its authority from the Pope and rules at the Pope's behest. Any other government is a de, jure, a de facto government and should be dis, uh, removed. All right. Now, this precautionary measure of ecclesiastical policy, carefully designed for the achievement of future results, these future results, I'll just tell you flat out, is the papal overthrow of our government has borne some fruits already, says R.W. Thompson. We see this in the fact that the members of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States appear today to be more formidably and compactly united in supporting and defending all the pretensions of the papacy than are the Roman Catholic pol uh, populations of any of the nations of Europe. In other words, this country is more Catholic than, the, than, than Europe. And the author's going to explain why, and we touched on it a little bit yesterday. Look, Europe had been uh, tyrannized by the papacy for centuries. Their eyes were open. The Protestant Reformation broke out in Europe, and they overthrew the papacy, canceled all their concordats, overthrew all their divine right rulers, those who got their power from the pope, and they elected their own governments. They wrote their own constitutions. They declared Christ their king because the, they were reading the Bible now for a change. They declared Christ their king, and they put the papacy back in the box. They kicked the Jesuits out of their country. They weren't going to let the Jesuits overthrow their governments. I mean, they got it right. They knew what was going on. But the Catholics in this country... They were loyal to the Pope. As extraordinary as it may seem, that's how it was. And it says, 
Among the most intelligent of the latter, those who have become familiar with, from long observation, the direct intercourse with the papal system, the foundations of that system have been destroyed. Papal concordats have been indignantly and contemptuously revoked. Papal bulls of anathema and excommunication have been defied and the ecclesiastical right to proclaim and enforce the decree of papal infallibility has been courageously and successfully resisted. Okay, that's, that's Europe. Now it says, and yet, in this country, we are furnished almost daily with renewed evidences of the enormous increase of hierarchical power. In other words, Roman Catholic like hierarchical power. The cardinals, the bishops, the archbishops, this is the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. We see evidence, renewed evidences of enormous increases of hierarchical power and of a blind and humiliating submission to the medieval doctrines of the encyclical and syllabus of Pope Pius IX and the extreme demands of the Jesuit and the ultramontane royalists of Europe. Many thousands of Roman Catholics of Europe, although living under the monarchical institutions, have the intrepid, intrepidity to disavow the tame utterances of Augustine. Listen, they rebelled against their chief saint who said, when Rome has spoken, that is the end of the matter, unquote. And these Roman Catholics assert their right to break loose from papal oppression and cling to the old church of the quote-unquote fathers. But the bulk of those in the United States, Roman Catholics in the United States, in Protestant USA, while shielded and protected by free institutions, in other words, Protestant institutions, seem so trained in this passive and slavish school of Augustine that they do not yet realize how surely and inevitably its tendency is to make them the mere tools of an imperious and exacting hierarchy whose professions and moderation are both delusive and insincere. They seem either incompetent or unwilling to understand how completely their manhood is forfeited by a compliance with the requirements of this ecclesiastical system, while in other respects they exhibit commendable intelligence and some of the best qualities of citizenship. The decree of papal infallibility was a severe blow at the cause of personal as well as political freedom. And by now consenting to make it the chief cornerstone of their ecclesiastical polity, they avowed their readiness beforehand to acquiesce in whatsoever shall be demanded of them, no matter how enormous it may be and to what degree of humiliation it may reduce them. Imagine this happening in the United States after Europe demonstrated the overthrow of the papacy. We have Roman Catholics ready to fawn at the feet of the vicar of God on earth, the Pope of Rome, in a Protestant country. How, how just utterly unlikely, but that was the case. And he says, there is no king now upon any throne who sets forth his pretensions in more imperious tones than Pope Pius IX. Yet they crouch at his feet as submissively as the slave at the feet of his taskmaster. When he insists, as other popes have done before him, that God has given him full power over the whole world, both in ecclesiastical and civil affairs, and that to maintain the contrary is impious and heretical, they give their open assent or tame acquiescence to this odious doctrine, though it may do violence to their most cherished and preconceived opinions. 
It is wonderful that such men do not profit more by that experience which comes from intercourse with the world, that they do not realize that magnitudes of their brethren, who once supported the cause of the papacy, have abandoned it on account of the very things which they sub, uh, to which they submit, and that the governments hitherto most obedient to the Pope have passed out of his hands and from under his control. How is it possible for them to shut their eyes so completely as they seem to do to the movements of the modern nations? Spain, formerly the most devoted of all of them, to papal supremacy, has within a few years made her queen a fugitive because she was the mere creature of an insolent priesthood, has weakened the power of that same priesthood because it had been trained in the school of the infamous and despised Inquisition, and has advanced so far toward a higher national development as to excite the hope in all liberal minds that she might be ultimately able to overthrow or throw off entirely the leaden weight of ultramontanism. In other words, rigid, Jesuitized Roman Catholicism. There was hope for Spain. They literally made their queen a fugitive. There was rebellion against the papacy in Spain, the most, co- the most Catholic country in all of Europe. Now he continues, he says, France withdrew her military support from the papal throne in order to humiliate a rival Protestant power, and she and the papacy both went down into a common wreck. And if she arises again under the papal flag, it'll be only to dig still deeper the grave into which all her aspirations of national glory will be buried. Austria has set aside her concordat with the Pope and proclaimed entire freedom of religious belief and has made herself an ally of the bitterest enemies of Pope Pius IX. Bavaria has refused to permit the dogma of papal infallibility to be proclaimed in her dominions because it is opposed to the fundamental articles of her constitution. Listen, little Bavaria got it. Uh, Sorry. Pope Pius IX, we're not going to let you be called infallible in this country because we know you're not infallible. You're a mere man. You're a usurpation of Christ. And we have our Constitution based on liberal tendencies, based on Protestant tendencies. And we have a Constitution that gives freedom of religion in this country. Little Bavaria wouldn't allow the Pope to proclaim his infallibility. Not so here in America. Let me read it again. Bavaria has refused to permit the dogma of infallibility to be proclaimed in her dominions because it is opposed to the fundamental articles of her Constitution, quote, and would place in jeopardy the rights of the non-Catholics of the country. In other words, they had respect for the Protestants. They knew that a decree of papal infallibility would strengthen the Roman Catholic Church in Bavaria and would result in persecution of God's people in Bavaria. They were sick and tired of this type of thing from the papacy, and they knew better, and they they put a stop to it. Bavaria. Now, it says, the open collision between Teutonic and Latin ideas has consolidated the Germanic states by the triumph of the former and left no hope for the papacy throughout all Germany unless reaction could be won by the impossible ascendancy of the odious principles of Jesuitism. In other words, only the Jesuits could save Germany from throwing off the papacy. That was just a call to the Jesuit priests to go into action in Germany and stop the Protestant Reformation and put Christ out of his throne and put the Pope back in it. Okay, And I say back in it because the Pope did at one time rule supreme over Europe. That's what we're talking about here. 
Europe got wise. It was America, Protestant America, Catholics in America that were blind to what the papacy was doing. It says, even Italy at the very door of the Vatican has snatched the scepter of the temporal dominion from the hands of the Pope, has invited Protestant churches and schools to be opened in Rome, has confiscated the property of the rich monastic orders, and appropriated the Quirinal and other papal palaces to the uses of the state. There is not left in all the earth a single government which either, with, uh, excuse me, with either the inclination or the power to defend the papacy, nor a single square mile of territory over which its temporal scepter can be wielded. And while all these things are consummated facts in history, and others of kindred import are rapidly transpiring, while these Roman Catholic uh, populations of Europe are beginning to breathe more like free men and are preparing for higher degrees of progress than they have yet attained, the followers of the papacy in the United States, with credible exceptions, are concentrating their exertions with wonderful unanimity in order to reforge the discarded fetters of papal tyranny and to manacle with them the limbs of the freest and happiest population on earth. Do not these events teach a philosophy which it becomes the American people to understand? Manifestly, they will fail in their duty to themselves, their country, and their age if they do not endeavor to understand it. And this warning from R.W. Thompson is even more appropriate and germane today than it was then, because we are at the very precipice, the very pinnacle of papal authority in this country. Rome has never had more authority in this country than she has today, simply because the American people, and particularly Protestants, but I include Catholics in this, failed to heed the warning of R.W. Thompson back in 1876. Now, we should not fail to keep in mind the distinction which undoubtedly exists between the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and its laity. Among the latter, the laity, there are beyond all question a large number of pious and sincere Christians who follow the teachings of their church with honest and pure intentions, and who are equally honest and sincere in their support of our republican and popular institutions, because they see, they see nothing in either incompatible with the other. But the author continues, he says, during the late rebellion, now he's speaking about the Civil War, remember this book was written in 1876, not long after the, the end of the Civil War, he says, during the late rebellion, in other words, during the Civil War, many of these, that is, American Roman Catholics, went into the national armies willingly and promptly and were as brave and zealous as any others in defending the nation's life and the integrity of the Union. But it cannot be honestly denied that the direct tendency during that same crisis of all that came from Rome, that is, from the papacy, was to give aid and comfort to those who were endeavoring to overthrow the government. In other words, the, the papacy supported the South, according to R.W. Thompson. And the letter that we read from the Pope to uh, the, the President of the South uh, was blatantly in support of the South. I'm going to continue the reading and discussion of uh, this book, but I want to preface uh, what, I'm write, what I'm reading right now with, with um, a precaution. The author takes the stand that the papacy supported the South. Now, I don't want to get into a debate with my listeners over who's to blame for the Civil War, North or South. We're wiser today. We know that the Jesuits fomented the Civil War, and they were working just as actively in the North as they were in the South. 
I don't want to result from this brief discussion of the Civil War to reflame the North versus South debate, because that works right into the Jesuits' hands. What we need to understand is that Rome had to divide in order to conquer this country and to change its form of government. Whether the Pope visibly supported the South and Jefferson Davis is only a matter of fact, but it is not the cause of the Civil War. The Jesuits caused the Civil War, and they were working to, in the North to reorganize the government. At the same time, they appeared to support the South. What, what, what Rome really intended to do was to change our Protestant form of government and to enslave us all. We have to be wise and we have to be knowledgeable about the Civil War in order to come to the right conclusions. And once we arrive at those conclusions, then the North versus South debate just disappears in insignificance. What becomes significant at that point is how Rome conquered the, the, the original government of this country. Now, during the late rebellion, the Civil War, many of these went, the Roman Catholics went into the national armies willingly and promptly and were as brave as zeal, as, and as zealous as any others in defending the nation's life and the integrity of the Union. But it cannot be honestly denied that the direct tendency during that same crisis of all that came from Rome was to give aid and comfort to those who were endeavoring to overthrow the government. And it is equally true that the open avowals of the Pope, in so far as they were designed to give political significance, had also the same effect. And that's a, a veiled reference to this letter that the Pope wrote to Jefferson Davis. Now, in no other way can the fact be accounted for that so large a number of Roman Catholic priests in this country sympathized with all the measures which were designed to break up the Union and destroy our institutions. And I would have interjected the word Protestant institutions. Now, all their ecclesiastical training, we're talking about the foreign trained Roman Catholic priests in this country, all their ecclesiastical training is so conducted as to prepare them for opposition to a popular form of government and for giving preference to monarchical principles. Why monarchical principles? Because the Pope is their monarch. How can they make the Pope the ruler of the United States so long as the United States values a government of, by, and for the people, a popular government? Now, these foreign-trained Roman Catholic priests exhibit abundant proof of this at all times, when collisions occur between the people and their monarchs who profess to govern by divine right, always opposing the former and taking sides with the latter. They could not pay obedience to the desires and commands of the Pope in any other way, nor would he consider their obedience to him complete, such as their ecclesiastical obligations impose upon them, unless they were always and everywhere ready to, to, to go to this extent. He measures their fidelity, that is, the Pope measures the fidelity of, their, of his priests to him by the readiness with which they adopt and promulgate these sentiments. Pope Pius IX, since he threw himself into the arms of the Jesuits, has so frequently avowed his hatred of a government of the people and his fondness for monarchy as to leave no doubt upon any properly informed mind about the condition in which he would place this nation if he possessed the power to regulate their affairs and construct their forms of government. He would pluck up and destroy every constitution or law which gives the people the right to frame their own institutions so as to reflect their own will and would require the whole world to recognize and adopt the doctrines of the divine right of kings to govern all the nations in obedience to the pontifical mandates. He demands 
this, uh, uh, he demands of his hierarchy and all the officers of the Roman Catholic Church in every country and under all circumstances and conditions, not merely that they shall maintain these sentiments themselves, but shall carefully instruct all the faithful to do the same, conceding to them only such a degree of discretion as allows them to regulate their utterances by expediency. In other words, what he's saying is, they have freedom only in this. They can modify their speech so as not to raise suspicion among the Protestants, even to the degree that they may renounce the Pope himself if it will put down any Protestant uprising. Okay, they may contradict, they may lie, they may twist, they may contort, they may Jesuitically use casuistry, whatever deception they can, by speech or in writing, to put down any Protestant suspicion of a of a of a a, a, a papal attack on our form of government. But yet that papal attack is to be taken is to is on pain of excommunication imposed upon every Roman Catholic. Now we're going to make this clear. This isn't this isn't just a blind assertion. The author is going to copiously make this clear. He says from these classes, both priests and laymen, the Pope exacts implicit obedience without inquiry or any appeal to their own reason. If it shall be yielded by the Roman Catholic population of the United States, and if it is really the design that the papal exactions shall be carried to the extent of interfering with their obligations as citizens, there is no difficulty in seeing that they will be ultimately led into an attitude of antagonism to our form of government. At this point lies the danger most seriously to be apprehended by the people of the United States, a danger which underlies many, if not all, of the questions by which this nation is periodically excited. While we may not now be able to anticipate the precise time or form of its appearing, we shall not be unprepared to meet it, if by any possibility it shall be here and after precipitated upon us. What he's talking about is a widespread Roman Catholic uprising to overthrow this government. Now, many suspected that eventually the Pope would drop his hand and all the Catholics would rise up and overthrow the government. But it has not happened that way. The Catholic power in this country, the hierarchy and the, the, the knowledgeable laity, the adepts, have simply infiltrated the government and slowly but surely continued to boil the toad. Slowly but surely, without raising the Protestant suspicion, have successfully overthrown the government. And still, the, the American people are oblivious to it. And still swooning over the love fest that took place under Vatican Council II, are not only not suspicious of a Roman Catholic overthrow of our government, but they want full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So the violent uprising that was anticipated by some did not occur, yet the country is overthrown. Now, will there come a time of violence? Obviously, I call this program Inquisition Update, because there will come a time when Rome becomes so powerful that she can do whatever she wants to the quote-unquote heretics, those who oppose her control of this country, and she'll resort to the same means, measures, and methods that she used during the Inquisition. Final resistance will be finally quenched. Rome is not going to put up with any opposition once she has the overwhelming majority opinion in the country. And Vatican Council II went a large distance in in gaining support from Protestants themselves. And so now Rome doesn't only represent 25% of the population. She can now claim to represent as many as 75% of the population of this country. She has a mandate from Vatican Council II 
and the effects that have that have stormed through the Protestant churches. So there is going to come a time, and in not in the not too distant future, when there will be Waco style raids all over the country. Anybody who puts a resistance up to the government, the Roman Catholic government, and the Roman Catholic churches in this country are going to be put out. Now, the author continues. By our form of government, all the laws have their source, both theoretically and practically, in the will of the people, and are therefore of human origin. The Constitution of the United States was ordained and established by the people, quote, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, unquote, directly from the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. Considered collectively, these objects include everything necessary to the happiness, prosperity, and elevation of a nation. And with the supreme and sovereign authority of the American people to preserve them for nearly a century, they have thus far proved to be much more conducive to these ends than any of the forms of government where kings or popes or potentates of any name or rank have been regarded as the only fountains of justice. That's in reference to the way things were in Europe before the Protestant Reformation. Now, this belief cannot be delusion in view of the fact of the present condition of the world and of the practical results before us. If it is, it is a delusion which the people of the United States have cherished, and it will, it, it is hoped, continue to cherish with all the fervor of the, in, uh, the, uh, with all the, fervor of the intensest patriot, patriotism. It would be unjust to say that among the number of those who do cherish it, there are not many Roman Catholic laymen, and now and then a priest, who have found shelter under our free institutions from European misgovernment and monarchical oppression. There are undoubtedly many of this class who do not believe when told that the papacy is now endeavoring by the most active and persistent efforts to substitute an ecclesiastical government, a Roman Catholic government, a papal government, for this government of the people. A grand, quote-unquote, holy empire for this free and popular republic which it has cost so much blood and treasure to establish and maintain. Restrained by the sincerity of their own intentions from suspecting others, they never stop a moment to inquire to what probable or possible point they may be led by the, in, the uninquiring obedience to their hierarchy which is demanded of them. And the hierarchy, taking advantage of their silence and construing it into acquiescence, let no opportunity escape to build up an ecclesiastical power comprehensive enough to absorb all those powers of the government and the people which the Pope shall consider to be in opposition to the law of God. So clearly R.W. Thompson is warning that the Roman Catholic priesthood has taken their, their own laity, the ignorance of their own laity, to as an opportunity to build a hierarchical system in this country that would eventually overthrow our government. And if the laity knew what the strategy of their priesthood was, valuing their Protestant liberties in this country would rebel against their priests, their bishops, their archbishops, their cardinals, and their popes, and they would say, enough of popery. They would do the same thing that the Roman Catholics of Europe did. But the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church kept the Roman Catholic laity in ignorance. 
and there weren't enough voices like R.W. Thompson in this country to raise a Protestant uprising, to raise a Roman Catholic uprising, and there wasn't enough stomach. After having fought the Civil War, to accept the inevitable, a religious war directly on its heels. And so this festering sore called Roman Catholicism has been without resistance in this country. Everyone's afraid to speak out against it. And now we've lost our country. That's my assertion. Many will disagree, but this is what R.W. Thompson predicted. And he said, these foreign-born ecclesiastics, talking about these foreign-trained Roman Catholic priests, many of whom were Jesuits, intent on destroying Protestantism and every Protestant institution, the most important of which is our Constitution and our democratic or republican form of government, he says, these foreign-born ecclesiastics have moved forward in their work with great caution and circumspection. Whenever they have been, able to, uh, been enabled to employ the pen of a native citizen, that's right, these foreign-born, foreign-trained, papally-trained Jesuit priests, whenever they have an opportunity to employ the pen of a native American citizen, they have done so in order that while secure in their own reticence for the time being, they could observe the effect produced. Now we're going to give an example of this where the Roman Catholic priesthood used an American-born citizen, and not only that, but a one-time Protestant who had converted to Roman Catholicism to promote the very things that these priests would promote if they could do it safely without raising Protestant suspicion. Now, what this man writes about, if it had been spoken or written by a Jesuit priest, would very well have raised the Protestant suspicion and awakened this country to what R.W. Thompson is warning about. This writer, this domestic Roman, uh, this domestic one-time Protestant, and 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 converted Roman Catholic. His name was Doctor O. A. Brownson. He is the pen through which the priests floated their trial balloon to get the reaction of the the American people. This is a very important segment of this chapter. Now, we're going to speak specifically about this Dr. O.A. Brownson. He said as early as 1849, Dr. O.A. Brownson, who had abandoned Protestantism under the pretense that it was necessary to human happiness that the whole world should be subjected to an ecclesiastical government, did not hesitate to utter in behalf of the papacy such doctrines as would, if, necess if established in this country, upheave the government of the United States and that of every state in the Union from their foundations. In an article on authority and liberty, he pointed out the absolute and plenary authority of God over all things spiritual and temporal, and denied that any body or community of men, as men, quote, has any rightful authority either in spirituals or temporals, unquote. As a consequence, he insisted that, quote, all merely human authorities are usurpations, and their acts are without obligation. In other words, you don't have to obey them. They are null and void from the beginning, unquote. In other and more practical words, that the authority of the people, now remember the people form the basis of our government, he says in practical words that the authority of the people of the United States over the government is usurpation, and that all the constitutions and laws they have ordained and enacted by this authority, the authority of the people, are without obligation, 
You don't have to obey them. They are null and void from the beginning, unquote. All, quote, unquote, right to command, whether of parent, pastor, prince, individuals, or communities, he, that is Brownson, centers in the Pope as the vicar of God on earth and in him alone. Brownson insists that through the Pope and by virtue of his authority, quote, religion must found the state, unquote. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church must rule over the state or be its, the state's foundation, and that the only, quote, absolute and unlimited freedom, unquote, consists in, quote, absolute and unconditional subjection to God, unquote, that is, to his vicar, the Pope, who alone is authorized to declare God's will. Everything contrary to this, notwithstanding the Constitution of the United States and that of every state in the Union, are contrary to it, he pronounces to be nonsense or blasphemy. Brownson said that the Constitution of the United States, which reflected the will of the people of this country, the very foundation of our government, and that of every state in the Union, is nonsense and blasphemy because all of its power is rooted in the people and not the Pope. Now, you might ask yourself, if you're truly a Christian... You understand that no man has the right to change God's law. No man has the right to usurp God's throne. No, no man or group of men, no community, no nation has the right to overthrow God's throne and to take his place and arbitrarily write its own laws. God's law is supreme. Every, every Christian would agree upon this. So why did this once Protestant O.A. Brownson not recognize in the Pope the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, the priests, as mere men. You see the, the, the twist that Satan can twist a man's mind? It is true. God is supreme. His law is supreme. He is the only divine right ruler in the universe. And men ought to obey him rather than men. But O.A. Brownson obeys men and then criticizes the rest of the people of this country from obeying a government of men and that we should put all of our faith, trust, and hope in the Pope and his priesthood. Because the Pope, says O.A. Brownson, is the mouthpiece of God on earth. And this lesson needs to be learned by everyone calling themselves ecumenical in this country. Every one of them would agree that God's law is supreme. And no man has the right to change God's law. No man has the right to overthrow God's throne. I mean, isn't that what Satan tried to do? Overthrow God's throne? Well, Satan didn't have the right to do it. Lucifer, at the time, before God changed his name, he led a rebellion in heaven, thought himself wiser than God, led a mutiny in heaven. That war now is fought right here on earth. Now, these same Christians who would acknowledge that no man has the right to change God's law, would turn right around and tell you, we need to come into full communi communion with the Pope. We need to unite all of Christianity under the mouthpiece of God, the Pope of Rome. And the truth of the matter is, and these are words that R.W. Thompson will never utter in this book, we need to realize that the Pope is the biblical and historical Antichrist. And that Christianity is heading ecumenically headlong into the son of perdition, the Church of Antichrist, seeking peace and unity with that very power that R.W. Thompson is warning us about in this book. 
This is a very prophetic book, very powerful book. It needs to be read in every church in this country, Catholic and Protestant alike. We're dealing now today with the consequences of not heeding the legitimate and rightful warning that R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the United States Navy, is giving to the American people in 1876.